My grandfather was diagnosed with cancer when I was 15. For a whole summer while I visited him in Georgia, I saw a skeleton of the man that I once knew. I had accompanied him to several doctor's visits, and while I truly believed my grandfather tried his best, just a year later, he ended up passing away. Surprisingly, it wasn't the cancer that killed him. My grandfather had died from an allergic reaction to all the cocktails of medicines that he'd been receiving to treat his cancer. And it pained me to lose a man that I loved and that had raised me. But it hurt me even more when I found out that the medicine intended to help him actually resulted in his death. At around the same time, I began to open my ears to the national conversation surrounding marijuana, weed, pot, or whatever you may interchangeably know this plant as. But it is crucial. We understand the scientific name is cannabis sativa. Now, cannabis has been used to treat symptoms of cancer like nausea, and I cannot say that cannabis could have cured my grandfather. But I do know that after listening to countless stories about cannabis's medical applications, I was only left urging more and wanting to know more and whether or not this plant could have been a safer alternative to the drugs that ended up killing my grandfather. So now, fast forward to present day. Cannabis is one of the largest growing industries in the nation with a projected revenue of $20 billion by 2020. And yet, there's enough skepticism that this plant still remains federally illegal, despite legalization efforts at the state level. The most common concern I hear about cannabis is that we don't know enough about it. Fortunately, I see that as an opportunity to illuminate the shadowy figure of cannabis with research and inquiry, driven by established research institutions like Brown University. And so, the largest obstacle for the cannabis community is securing federal research funding to fully substantiate cannabis's medical use. Our federal law currently classifies cannabis as a Schedule I drug alongside heroin. If we look at the definition of a Schedule I drug, we'll see that drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. In response to the claims of cannabis' high potential for abuse, we've seen that in waves, groups such as veterans suffering from PTSD are abandoning prescription painkillers in favor of cannabis due to it having less adverse side effects. Researchers must secure approval from the DEA to have federal studies done. Yet, the DEA and the federal government adhere to this paradoxical federal law. And so, federal law stands in opposition to the growing support we see of medical cannabis states. There are currently 29 states with medical cannabis programs, including our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And yet, there's no medical recognition of cannabis in our national law. And we see here a list of qualifying health conditions from different medical programs, med medical cannabis programs in the United States. Cancer, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, a wide range of health benefits, but only accepted at the state level. And with all our modern research technologies and capabilities, 
I would hope to know more about how cannabis specifically affects our bodies. One steps towards doing that is learning about the human endocannabinoid system, which is a physiological system within our bodies that was discovered in the 1950s, specifically with the help of the cannabis sativa plant, hence the term endocannabinoid system. Now, growing up, I heard of my skeletal system, I heard of my central nervous system, but I have never heard of the endocannabinoid system until recently. And to think that the endocannabinoid system could be a link between us and the potential health benefits seen in cannabis only begs me to want to urge and push our society in a way that we can break barriers and engage our skepticisms with research and inquiry. Now, Northern Michigan University has taken a monumental step towards this. They have established the first ever medicinal plant chemistry degree. Now, please do not be fooled. This degree has 67 credits riddled with rigorous courses, including organic chemistry and biology. This is not the coursework associated with the lazy stoner stereotype. And I would like to see more research institutions like Brown University push to illuminate our fears with this research and inquiry. I mentioned my initial question was, can, are there other alternatives, safer alternatives than the prescription pills that killed my grandfather? I truly believe we have the ability to answer all, all of our own questions. But we must be willing to break barriers and explore the unknown. Thank you.